Hi, I am Nara Hamare from the World Bank. I'm a lead economist and program manager in the Development Data Group. And one of my roles is to manage the International Comparison Program, or for short, the ICP. I am here today primarily to talk about how the results from the ICP are used and why the program plays a crucial role in today's data-driven landscape of information and analysis. But first, let me give you a little background. The ICP is one of the largest statistical initiatives undertaken at regular intervals across the world. In fact, nearly 180 economies took part in the ICP's most recent cycle in 2017, covering all of the globe's region. North America with three economies, Latin America and the Caribbean with 39, Sub-Saharan Africa with 45, the Middle East and North Africa with 17, Europe and Central Asia with 46, South Asia with seven, and lastly, East Asia and Pacific with 19 economies in the region. As well as being one of the world's biggest data exercises, it is also one of the most enduring, having started in 1968, and as we speak today, the ICP teams around the world are conducting data collection for the 10th global comparison with the reference year of 2021. Over this time, the use made of the program's results has widely expanded. So much so that today, data from the ICP are fundamental to, and indeed enable, a vast variety of data and indicators across the socioeconomic spectrum, making it an intrinsic part of measuring the size of economies and their price levels and a critical tool in development analysis. And it is this multitude of uses and applications that we will explore further. First, let's look at what producing the ICP's results entail. Simply put, local price data collected and expenditure data compiled for the ICP by national statistical offices allow us to calculate purchasing power parities, or PPPs for short, as well as price levels for each participating economy. Of course, there are many other stages involved in the ICP lifecycle, such as conducting research, and establishing methodology, setting standards and providing guidelines to countries, identifying what goods and services to price, data collection, validation, processing, followed by quality assurance, and ultimately disseminating and analyzing the results and advising on how to use them. So why do we put all this effort into calculating PPPs? Well, PPPs differ from market exchange rates as they control for the differences in price levels between economies. Therefore, PPPs equalize the purchasing power of the resulting currency conversions. In doing so, they allow us to compare, using a common currency, measures of GDP and its expenditure components across economies, which reflect only differences in the volume of economic outputs unlike market exchange rate-based comparisons, which reflect both volume and price differences. Our most recent ICP results provided us with an in-depth picture of the global economy prior to the emergence of COVID-19. Let's look at a visualization showing these results at the level of GDP. First, the ICP's price level indexes calculated as the ratio of an economy's PPP to the market exchange rate, show how expensive or cheap an economy is compared to the world average set at 100. In 2017, Bermuda was the most expensive at the level of GDP, standing at 204, while Egypt was the cheapest at 27. We can add in the PPP-based GDP per capita for each economy to see the relationship between prices and income. Burundi had the lowest GDP per capita at just under $800, while Luxembourg had the highest of over $112,000 in 2017. And we can also see the size of each economy by adding GDP as the bubble size. The two largest economies were China and the United States, with a GDP just under $20 trillion each, with India third at $8 trillion in 2017. 
And as I mentioned earlier, because we calculate PPPs for the different components of GDP, such as goods and services under food, health, education, investment, we can compare prices and expenditures across all these categories. For instance, PPPs for health provide us with a comparison of per capita expenditures on health and the relative cost of these goods and services consumed. The ICP results show us that the USA spends nearly $10,000 per person on health per year, the highest of any economy. Germany, in second place, spends just over $6,000 per person. But the price of health goods and services is highest in the Cayman Islands, Switzerland, Bermuda, and Iceland, all of whom have price levels at more than double the world average for health services. The data you've just seen are from the global ICP database housed at the World Bank, from which you can download custom data for your own analysis. And remember that you are not limited to PPPs at the level of GDP. If you wish to examine expenditures and volumes on a particular sector, say health, education, transport, investment, etc., these component PPPs may be more suitable for your analysis. Of course, PPPs, price levels, and other ICP results are vital data tools that are applied across a range of development indicators produced by different organizations, such as Eurostat, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the International Energy Agency, the International Labor Organization, the International Monetary Fund, the International Telecommunication Union, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, the United Nations Development Program, UNESCO, the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, or WHO, as well as the World Bank and regional development banks and UN agencies. PPP-based indicators from these and other organizations allow national governments, policymakers, and other users to measure the effectiveness of current domestic policies, compare themselves with other economies, and track development and progress over time. And it will come as no surprise that PPPs feature in many of the indicators used to track progress by countries towards the Sustainable Development Goals. These include no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation and infrastructure, and reduced inequalities. We are also delighted to hear that our colleagues at UNESCO will be using PPPs in the near future to estimate expenditure on the preservation of cultural and natural heritage as part of SDG 11. We've brought this multitude of uses together in our new publication, Purchasing Power Parities for Policy Making, a visual guide to using data from the International Comparison Program. Released in June 2021, both as a PDF download and as an interactive web-based publication, the guide illustrates these uses and application through 70 data visualizations of PPP-based indicators and ICP-enabled analysis, together with descriptions of the policy areas in which they are used. These are organized under 11 topics. These cover the size of the economy and price levels, poverty and inequality, trade and competitiveness, labor costs, wages, and social safety nets, food and nutrition, health, education, energy and climate, infrastructure, human development, and administrative uses. Let's explore some of them now. We saw previously that the use of PPPs helps us to analyze the size of economies. We can see how these change over time by keeping prices constant. And because we are using a common currency, we can group these economies into regions or income groups. This chart looks at the change in PPP-based GDP by region over the last 20 years, 
we can see clearly the increase in the East Asia and Pacific regional economy over that time. The ICP also provides a measure of actual individual consumption per capita. This is considered a better measure of material well-being than GDP per capita, as it accounts for goods and services actually consumed by households, irrespective of whether they were purchased and paid for by households directly or by government or by nonprofit organizations. This chart shows that being income rich in terms of GDP per capita does not always marry with high individual consumption or material well-being, especially in economies considered investment hubs or with high natural resource rents. The guide also features data from countries that have used ICP methodology to construct PPPs at the sub-national level to reflect the different price levels and economic structures prevalent within a country. These sub-national PPPs can assist with domestic analysis at the state, province, and regional levels and help direct appropriate local specific policy initiatives. One such country is Vietnam, which estimates subnational PPPs for its spatial cost of living index, showing differences across its six economic regions. Tracking poverty and inequality is important to the development agendas of many countries, as well as international agencies, and forms the basis of SDGs 1 and 10, which rely on PPP-based estimates of income or consumption in different countries and in different population groups. And as you know, the international poverty line is currently set at $1.90 a day in PPP terms, reflecting the minimum needed in low-income countries to rise above extreme poverty. This chart shows the share of the population living in extreme poverty in various countries, as well as the mean shortfall in income or consumption below this line. SDG 1 also examines the working poverty rate, which identifies those that live in poverty despite working. This metric from the ILO indicates the adequacy of employment-related incomes, the quality of employment, and the state of the labor market. The chart shown here illustrates how this share of the population has changed in low- and middle-income countries since 2000. Turning to competitiveness, the World Economic Forum uses PPPs and PPB-based indicators in two of its indexes. First, the Global Competitiveness Index identifies 12 main drivers of productivity, one of which is market size, which includes PPP-based GDP as one of its inputs. Second, the Travel and Tourism Competitiveness Index measures the set of factors and policies that enable the sustainable development of the travel and tourism sector. One factor in this index is a country's price competitiveness, as shown in this map, which includes as an input the ratio of a country's PPP to the official market exchange rate. SDG 8 calls for sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. It highlights the importance of achieving equality of pay and protecting labor rights. At the same time, SDG 10 seeks to reduce inequality within and among countries and urges the adoption of policies, especially fiscal, wage, and social protection policies to progressively achieve greater equality. PPP-based data from the ILO and others on labor income and wages are key tools enabling policymakers to monitor progress towards these goals, such as the earnings of both women and men, as shown in this chart. Such data provide a tool to review pay differentials and progress towards gender parity. Another use of PPP-based data is in SDG 2, which monitors both the agricultural productivity and incomes of small-scale food producers in PPP terms. Continuing with wages, 
ICP data on the compensation of public sector workers are used by the World Bank's Worldwide Bureaucracy Indicators Database to help policymakers analyze the competitiveness of wages and the personnel dimensions of state capability. The SPIDER chart here shows these data being used to calculate pay compression ratios in public sector occupations by country income group. Another use of the data collected by the ICP is examining food prices and expenditures. These have informed a host of studies by the Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO, Tufts University, IFPRI, and others on how income and prices influence dietary patterns, the prevalence of undernutrition and overnutrition or obesity, and the gap in healthy and nutritious diets between rich and poor. One example is shown here and uses ICP food prices to establish the most affordable cost of the diet, recommended by the Eat Lancet Commission. When expressed in PPP terms, these costs can be compared with metrics such as the PPP-based international poverty lines and PPP-based household income data to establish affordability. Strengthening health financing is an SDG objective in Goal 3. Policymakers directing initiatives to reduce both inequalities in healthcare and the impact of healthcare costs on the most vulnerable can access PPB based measures of health expenditures from the World Health Organization, such as the average household out of pocket expenditure on health. This map shows how this metric varies across the globe. SDG 4 looks to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. UNESCO monitors PPP-based education expenditure per student by level of education and by source of funding as part of analyzing progress towards this goal. In doing so, it allows policymakers to assess the impact of investment in public education systems. This chart shows the level of funding by government or household and by education level for a few selected countries. PPPs are also used to measure the effects of climate change, the extreme socioeconomic consequences of which have brought fossil fuel emissions and mitigation and adaptation efforts to the fore in both national and international policymaking. The climate indicator CO2 emissions per unit of value added is used to measure progress towards the SDG 9 target, which looks to upgrade infrastructure and retrofit industries to make them sustainable. This chart shows CO2 emissions per unit of BPP-based GDP by income group since 2001. A similar metric is used in SDG 7. Countries have pledged to double the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency by 2030 by making energy efficiency a policy and investment priority. The energy intensity level of primary energy, defined as the ratio of energy supply to PPP-based GDP, is the official SDG indicator provided by the International Energy Agency, used for measuring progress towards this target, and is an indication of how much energy is used to produce one unit of economic output. Gross capital formation, or GCF for short, is a driver of economic growth, and policymakers looking at investment strategies can examine ICP price levels and expenditures on GCF, as shown in this chart for all countries. Users can also examine ICP price levels and expenditures on the GCF components of machinery and equipment and construction. This chart here shows the different indicators available from the ICP for construction, such as price levels, expenditures, 
per capita expenditures, share in global construction expenditures, and share in total GDP expenditures. Remember, these indicators are available for all published components of GDP, including food, housing, education, health, transportation, and others. Economic growth is also bolstered by investment in research and development, or R&D. And encouraging innovation is one of the objectives of SDG 9. The Global Innovation Index uses many PPP-based indicators to help countries evaluate their innovation performance, while UNESCO compiles PPP-based indicators on expenditure on R&D. Furthermore, ensuring that all parts of society can access information and communication technology underpins the Broadband Commission's 2025 Goals for Sustainable Development. Policymakers can monitor affordability through data on the price, expressed in PPP terms, of mobile voice services, mobile data, and fixed broadband for countries and regions by the International Telecommunication Union, as shown in this chart. The UNDP's Human Development Index assesses countries' performance through a measure of average achievement in three key areas of human development, including a decent standard of living as measured by PPP-based GNI per capita and illustrated in this map. Furthermore, the OECD's Better Life Index is an initiative that seeks to help governments put well-being at the center of policymaking. And this chart shows the three PPP-based indicators, wealth, disposable income, and earnings that are used within the index. The European Commission, International Monetary Fund, and World Bank all employ PPP-based indicators for administrative purposes too. PPP-based GNI per capita is used to identify member states that may qualify for the European Cohesion Fund. And the International Monetary Fund uses PPP-based GDP to determine its members' quota in terms of special drawing rights for financing and voting. Similarly, the World Bank incorporates PPPs into its dynamic formula, which provides the necessary anchor and a data-driven analysis for shareholding discussions. I've shared with you today a snapshot of the wide use made of PPPs and ICP data to illustrate this unique global public good that helps us understand our world today. There are many more examples in our guide and on our website, and we provide comprehensive information about when and where it is appropriate to use this data and where it's not. Our team here in DC and colleagues in ICP partner agencies are always happy to help guide users and data producers in their application of these data too. Join me as we look forward to the next set of ICP results for reference year 2021, for which the price and expenditure data are currently being collected and compiled, and which will throw a detailed light on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic across our global economy. Thank you.